Thank you for having me here today. Um, I came back to Chicago a few years ago, and one of the first things I did when I came to Chicago was this conference. Um, so it's neat to be back here in this room with some familiar faces. Um, and quite an honor to follow Dr. Hannenberg and be part of this conversation. Um, vocational discernment is certainly a topic that um, affects me personally and professionally on a regular basis. Um, as Steve said, I am the Associate Director of Campus Ministry at Loyola, and I assure you that about 15 years ago when I entered college, I had absolutely no thought of doing this job that I have, nor would I ever be in this room, nor would I be talking about any of these topics. So <laughs> vocation is a journey. It all kind of ebbs and flows. Um, if you'll permit me, I hope to share a few stories um, from my own vocational journey and how it might tie into sort of the historical context that uh, Dr. Hannenberg presented to us. So my first story. During my second semester of my freshman year of college, approximately one year before I met Craig, so my life existed before him, um, I received a letter in the mail. And I have to tell you, as a college student, receiving mail that is not a bill is probably one of the greatest things that can happen to you. And as I opened up the envelope, I saw a letter from my high school youth minister and an application to work at a Christian summer camp. At the time, I did nothing with campus ministry at Boston College, even though the campus ministry office is chock full with wonderful opportunities. Um, I didn't participate in a Bible study. I wasn't going to church. Um, I, though I had been very involved in my youth group in high school, when I went to college, my number one priority was m continuing to hold my volleyball scholarship, which is actually what took me out to the East Coast. Um, I like to say my religion was volleyball. It made more sense. To, it made sense to me before God did, which who still doesn't totally make sense to me, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> All that to say, I ha that wasn't my context at the time, and I had no real thought of getting involved in ministry. Personal ideas and desires. I didn't think I was holy enough. I didn't think I was good enough. I didn't think I was smart enough. I didn't think I had any experience that would actually make me qualified or capable of working at a Christian summer camp. Um, and so I think my youth minister might have picked up on that. And she, in her letter, not only encouraged me to apply, but gave me concrete reasons why she thought I should. Um, here is a gift I see in you. Here is something I've seen you do before, and I think you need to apply. And so I, was a, I had nothing else to do. I think I was procrastinating, studying for an exam or something. I was like, well, I'll just fill out the application. And I called my mom, asking her to give me names of religious books that I could say I had been reading. It was, um, <laughs> may or may not have been fabricated. But <laughs> lo and behold, they selected me to go spend the summer after my freshman year working um, on a high ropes course at a summer camp. Um, so I spent my whole summer, um, I was 19 years old, I was dangling from trees about 50 feet above the ground um, and trying to help figure out how to use language to talk to high school students from a myriad of backgrounds about God's love. For me, it was a perfect way to spend my summer. On top of it being very fun, I also had the opportunity to work side by side with professional youth ministers. Who, um, and then I also had the opportunity to be the role of minister, something I had not had in the past. And I loved it. I loved so many things about it. It's fun to work at a summer camp. I mean, let's be honest. That part was easy, but some of the more challenging moments, while they were challenging, I liked the challenge it provided to me. Um, and until that summer, I had never considered that full-time youth ministry was actually a vocation or something I could do. Despite the fact that I had wonderful youth ministers in high school, it never occurred to me that that was an actual job. Um, that fall, I returned back to Boston, and I switched my pre-med psychology program to a theology major. And thankfully, because I was on a volleyball scholarship, my parents couldn't tell me no. So I had that freedom and ability to do that, and when they expressed concern, I said, but I'm paying for school, so you can't tell me what to do. Um, they just want me to be happy. So a few things to point out in that story for me. The first, I was invited by someone who cared about me. I was invited by someone who had a relationship with me. Um, she knew my gifts, she knew my weaknesses, she knew where some of my passions might have been that I didn't necessarily recognize in myself. Um, instead of assuming I knew those things, she reached out to me and told me. And that concrete feedback was, I had no idea. And it, when I, I find that when I do this with college students now, they're shocked when you give them concrete feedback. I think people are told, you're awesome, you're great, way to go, all the time. But to say, I think you in, interact with um, people who are not connecting to other people really well and you find ways to bring them in, that's really great. Like I want to encourage you in that. You know, when you're working with someone who's living on the streets, you have a different way of talking with them when you're there and you help them feel loved and you help affirm their dignity. If you can give them something concrete, it changes everything because they don't see it in themselves. And ironically, the same thing happened to me, even though I'm always surprised it happens with these college students I work with. Um, 
but I want to go back that the relationship was really the key. Um, had, a, had I received that application from a stranger, I would not have submitted it. Had I received it, if I'd just seen it online, I, I, would, I didn't believe I could do it, so I wouldn't have done anything with that. I trusted that my youth minister knew me in my good moments and my bad moments, and if she believed in me, then I should consider it. Secondly, I think this call that happened for me did not involve checking a box of priesthood, consecrated religious life, marriage, etc. This was, for me, an invitation to be part of God's work in high school students' lives. And it was in a way that used my passions for faith, for the outdoors, and quite frankly for climbing, which is something that has been part of my life, conti continue to be part of my life even now, um, and in a way to serve others. The last point, this call came from outside myself. It was an external call through someone else, and it was a call to be with and for others. Um, I did drink the Je Jesuit Kool-Aid pretty early on. I continue to drink my Jesuit Kool-Aid on a daily basis. It keeps me in my profession. Um, but I, I had been trained in my Jesuit education that um, a person of faith meant you needed to be a person for others, looking to imitate the selfness, selflessness that Jesus himself demonstrated for us, and this was no exception. I believe at its best that vocational discernment happens both externally and internally, combined together, all interwoven together. Externally, my youth minister told me to apply. The camp took a chance on an unknown kid. Um, but internally, my own discernment process had just begun. I had the actual experience of ministering to others, of hearing the stories of other youth ministers and how they lived their lives. And then I started feeling this desire to imitate them and to be part of their existence and to, to know more and wanting to know if I fit that way. I loved hearing the students' stories that I was with, and I watched them develop language to talk about their relationship with God. What struck me as odd was it seemed like I was good at it, and I never really thought that I was good at anything. And so for me, it was something that felt natural and normal, and I could actually feel myself being good at something. And this work that I did on the ropes course, and I put that in quotations, I was dangling 50 feet above the ground. Let's be honest, it's not that much work. Um, but there were challenging moments, but even the challenging moments didn't feel like work. They felt like something I wanted to do. Um, from there, I self-selected into a variety of other ministries in my lifetime. You don't need my resume, but I jumped around. I worked at a retreat center for a year with the Capuchins, so I love the Franciscans. I have a little bit of them in my blood, too, so don't rule me out just because I like Jesuits. Um, I, uh, I ran a parish youth ministry uh, program in New York where I was with a diocesan parish, so I had no affiliation with, uh, with a particular order at that point. And I ended up working down in Washington, D.C. as a high school teacher and uh, campus minister there, and so on. Um, I kept self-selecting in and trying new things out. Um, I think one thing about vocational discernment, figuring out what you are not called to do sometimes is just as important what you're called to do. Um, I had a horrible immersion experience in Nicaragua, another story for another time, um, and I also facilitated a number of junior high retreats. No offense, I think that's what I'm supposed to say here. Um, <laughs> no offense, I am confident in saying I am not called to work with junior high students. Um, I believe that is a calling save for the truly exceptional, patient, and very, very odd. If you have to deal with them, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> And I'm sure you have children that are junior high students, and again, no offense. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me. Um, each experience did challenge me to grow professionally, but also to start paying attention to that inner compass in my heart, the inner compass that was pointing me into my vocation and continues to point me as my vocation shifts and is molded. Um, I very much appreciate many of the things that Dr. Hannenberg said, but um, one of the things that stands up for me is the contributions that Luther offered. Um, I have a confession for the group. Craig is probably the only one in this room that knows this. I did not grow up Catholic. I'm sorry. Um, good, good news, I became Catholic my senior year of college, so I'm still part of the club. It's okay, I'm in. Um, but I did not grow up this way. Um, I had a very, very positive experience in my Lutheran upbringing, um, so hearing some of Luther's contributions actually really warms my heart. Um, in not growing up Catholic, I was never totally introduced to these vocational boxes of priesthood, religious life. Um, as a Lutheran, I was called to follow Jesus, and I was called to help others know that God loves them. I was told time and time again that my faith was not a Sunday thing, but an everyday thing. And anytime we do anything, we have the opportunity to share God's love with others, whether it be in music or sports or anything you do, you should be sharing God's love. Um, it's cheesy. I think some of it kind of got rooted in me because I kind of dig this stuff still, so something worked. Um, after I became Catholic and I started hearing about these boxes, they felt very limited to me. Um, 
particularly because at the time, and even now, there, there are moments I don't really feel like I'm in any of those boxes. Um, I remember a friend asking me recently, so if I feel called to married life and there are enough good men out there and I never find my guy, does that mean I don't have a vocation? Um, and that's a really scary thought. And, it, and I appreciate hearing that there are people who are called to the single life, but when there are people who are genuinely called to married life and maybe don't find that person, what does that mean? So those boxes it could be exclusive, and I don't think that's, I don't see God in the scriptures or the God that I've experienced ever being exclusive. Um, there's always a welcoming and a bringing in. Um, I think Pope Francis actually just said today that we're bringing more people in. So if you haven't read his address, it's quite beautiful. I encourage you to get there at some point. A front page of the New York Times. So we're relevant. Um, so let me see where I'm at. So rather than using boxes, Luther names that every work is a calling from God. Um, for me, this is pivotal to a conversation with a young person about discernment. One of the retreats, I run more retreats. I, the joke is that I retreat more than the French. I, again, no offense to any of the French people in the room. One of the retreat programs that I facilitate um, is focused on vocational discernment. And we approach it by encouraging students to look at their passions, to look at their gifts, and to look at where those two intersect that can be used to serve other people in the world. Um, in fact, students can see their passion for, for business, for medicine, for law, for teaching, for whatever it might be, as a way to live deeply, as a way to live authentically, and as a way to live with purpose. Each type of work can be a calling and an opportunity to serve others. Additionally, the students hear from professional staff as they talk about their own journeys, the mentors and companions that have been with them on their journeys, and the motivations they hold for the work that they do. And I found that this approach to, approach to vocational discernment is more inviting and inclusive of the diverse students that I encounter. The final talk of that retreat is where does love fit in? I don't use the Hanson song. If any of you are familiar, where is the love? I make sure that never, ever, ever comes up because songs get played in retreats all the time. It's, it's a thing. Anyway, ultimately, I believe this whole vocational discernment idea is really rooted in this idea of love. In the opening prayer of the spiritual exercises, Ignatius of Loyola has this beautiful prayer called the first principle and foundation. And there's a line in it that I think is the sum of what our actual call to life is. And that is we are from love, of love, and for love. If we recognize ourselves as loved into existence, as loved not because of what we do, but for who we are, we are then led into a response. A response that asks us to share that love in our relationships, in our service, and in any engagement we have with the world. For me, vocation is about how we love. To help others in vocational discernment is to help them realize who they are, whose they are, and then invite them to reflect the reality that they are loved children of God as a response to that love. I think we see this in the scriptures all the time. Jesus calls us to love one another as I have loved you. Paul tells us that you can have all the spiritual gifts in the world, but if you have no love, it doesn't matter. John's letters tell us that if we love one another, then God remains in us. For me, this has to be the starting point. How can we help young adults respond to a call to love? And I think in that moment, the other things will come into play. I think there's great freedom in acknowledging and accepting this love as it gives one the chance to free from judgment, free from the expectations of others, free from what society is telling them to do, to lean into a space where there is trust in the Holy Spirit's guidance. I talked earlier that there's external discernment, there's internal discernment or vocational call, and the Holy Spirit works in both. I think in this space there will be, there will be something true, there will be something good, and in that we will find vocation to priesthood and we will find vocation to being part of a religious community or of being single or of being married. But I think that space of learning how to love will then lead into that. I think of the vine and the branches. That vine is love. That vine is our experience of God. And those branches are all those other experiences, the passions, the joys. In Ignatian spirituality, again, I'm sorry I drank the Kool-Aid real bad, we often hear Ignatius talk about the deepest desire of the heart. Our deepest desires are where, according to Ignatius, is where we find God, and it's where we find um, our passion and our purpose in life. Should we have the courage to tap into those desires, and it does require courage because it can be scary to know what you truly want, we, f we are able to, be, we, to unabashedly commit our lives and our hearts to something bigger than ours, bigger than our own selves. F permit me, I'm reminded of a line from The Sound of Music. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, but the part I used to fast forward through when I was little because the Reverend Mother scared me a little bit. I went back and listened to it a lot more when I got older. But she sings to Maria about the dream that will need all the love you can give every day of your life for as long as you live. 
I think my early understanding of vocational discernment kind of stemmed from that because I would rewind it and watch it over and over and over and over again. Um, I sometimes wonder if that's not what vocation is though. Um, what are we committing our life to? What are we willing to give our time to? Our, our, what are we going to wake up in the morning with and what are we going to read and who are we going to know? Um, Ignatius doesn't stop there. He tells us these desires lead us outside of ourselves and that's where service comes in. We come to see our gifts as just that. They are gifts for us to share with others and our desires help us learn how to channel those gifts for the kingdom of God. And I think helping young adults recognize a vocation a call is to provide opportunities for them where they can unearth these de deepest desires within them and then begin the process of harnessing them into the how of how they live their lives. And I think that how is really key in vocation. Another important point that Dr. Hannenberg raises is the call to holiness from Vatican II. For me, I wanna push that a little bit further and look at language and see if we might be able to use the word wholeness instead of holiness. Uh, from our mature students of faith, I think holiness is a topic we can discuss and it doesn't hold negative connotations and they're on board and they're excited to follow Jesus. Um, I find that number to be small. Um, the larger group of students that I work with, whether it be at the high school in DC, the students I worked with in Boston College, or the students I work with now at Loyola, um, they're still trying to break free of some of the stereotypes of words, um, and maybe they didn't have great catechesis growing up, um, but if I, they sort of say, if they hear being holy, they're thinking of a list of thou shalt nots. Um, and I don't think, I rarely do have enough time in that conversation to explain the beautiful opportunities that holiness offers to you and the fullness of life that Jesus Christ has offered because they've already stopped listening to you and now they're just smiling and nodding and thinking, I need to check my Facebook, I need to check, oh, I think there's gonna be a good Instagram coming up. Oh my gosh, someone posted this and it's awesome, Snapchat. Um, <laughs> if you don't know what Snapchat is, let me know, I can show you later. Um, however, I think wholeness is a little bit different, has a different context for them. I think the call to living as a full person and caring for the many aspects of your lives is more appealing to college students. And I, th I would imagine for young adults as well. I think it's appealing to college students because it speaks to their experience of having to try to pull passions from many different places. Their lives have far more opportunity than even me. I'm 12 to 15 years older than the students I work with, and I'm blown away by how many opportunities they have. The number of clubs and organizations, the number of friends they have because of Facebook. Um, college students are using online dating. I don't understand this. I'm like, you have people living in your building. Why are you going so far? Pay money for it online. Anyway, um, but they have so many more potential majors they have to select from. Um, so they have a lot of potentially more passions that they've tapped into at an earlier age. I think approaching wholeness necessitates us to give them space to process, to pray, and to integrate what all those things are. And I think through that, vocational discernment will, will happen. I believe at our core, people desire to be whole. And I think St. Irenaeus says it best, the glory of God is the human person fully alive. And for me, fully alive means being whole. I'm gonna wrap up with one more story. Um, I was talking to one of my colleagues in campus ministry about this, this presentation, and I said, I don't really know how to end it. I don't know what to talk about. And she said, why do you do what you do? Like, what student's face comes to mind? And I immediately was like, Gianna Rico. Um, I had the great privilege of meeting a woman named Gianna Rico when I was a high school teacher and campus minister. I met her at an information meeting for a service trip that I was um, facilitating to El Salvador. She came across as confident, as passionate, as articulate, and deeply committed to service. To say that I was impressed by her would be an understatement. She actually sent me an email that night to let me know how excited she was that the trip exist existed, and that even if I didn't pick her for the trip, she still thought I was really cool. So um, we knew there was something a little bit wrong with her because she thought it was cool, but we, we, got, we moved past that. Um, I will be honest, I almost didn't pick her because I thought she must be the person that gets picked for everything. And when you get into places where campus ministry is kind of the cool thing, it doesn't happen often, but occasionally it does, and you, people get picked for the same thing over and over again, so trying to spread out sort of the leadership opportunities. Um, but then it was the first year running the trip, so I got a little selfish, and I thought having a few rock star students with me wouldn't be a bad thing, so I picked her. Um, I watched her thrive and come alive in this country. Um, I saw her connect with people who she, we met and she let the country's history and their present really break her heart in truly beautiful ways. She told me of her dreams of entering the Peace Corps when she graduated from college and how she wanted to make her life about advocating for the poor. You know, every amazing outcome you've ever had for any program you've ever run. And then I thought to myself, I'm awesome. I did something right today, hooray. It wasn't until I left that high school to come to Loyola that I got a letter from her parents and heard the rest of the story. I heard the story of the high school student who struggled to get B's, even though her older sister was a straight A student in AP classes. 
The story of her applying for every play, every musical, every art scholarship and being told no. Of asking to usher for plays and musicals and being told no. She tried to start an equestrian team but was given the runaround and eventually gave up. She tried to sign up for a domestic service trip and another staff member told her she was turned down for the trip because she completed her application in green ink. Gianna just kept trying. She just never gave up. When she told her parents she wanted to apply for the El Salvador trip, her, they told me that they were terrified. They thought this was gonna be just one more epic failure in her, their daughter's attempt to try to be involved in a community that said, we do community and we do faith and we're so excited to have you. And then she was selected. At our, at our parent meeting that happened after they were selected, I approached her parents. Because again, to me, she's this rock star who, I don't know who her parents are, but they made her a beautiful woman of grace and compassion, and I couldn't believe that she was a high school student. She was so mature. And so I approached them. I always like to meet parents, and I exp expressed my deep gratitude to them um, for sharing their daughter with us. Gianna's mom wrote in her letter that she cried the entire way home because someone finally saw her daughter the way she did, as talented, as passionate, and deeply loved. I wish I could tell you I picked her for that reason. Um, I, I didn't, I didn't know. I felt selfish choosing her because I thought it was gonna make my job easier. But ultimately, I think the Holy Spirit really stepped in and did something pretty amazing. For me, I can't imagine being part of a more fantastic journey. Um, of seeing a woman committed to not giving up, of finding ways to serve even when others told her she couldn't serve. Um, of seeing a woman come alive and get connected to her vocation of advocacy and service. She was finally able to live into the fullness of her call, into the wholeness that she had been seeking. And these are the moments that bring me life. My vocation is deeply intertwined with helping others de determine and find their own vocational call. Um, and deeply intertwined with helping recognize the gifts and passions that others have to try to help build the kingdom of God. Part of my desire has always been to pay for that experience I had of a college student, of someone seeing something in me and helping me wake to my own vocation. It was a privileged moment to watch that awakening happen in this woman, who's actually now living in Central America in the Peace Corps, as she said she would when she would graduate. When someone asks me what my vocation is, I respond, I minister to college students. I, I'm committed to Jesuit pedagogy and, and spirituality, and I drink the Kool-Aid, and anyone who will listen to me will listen to me talk about the exam and this wonderful form of reflection, and have you heard about Cura Personalis, and I like Latin now. Um, I tell people that my vocation is playing volleyball, um, especially in the summer here, because Chicago is pretty much the best city in the country to play volleyball, um, in rock climbing, in supporting my friends, in loving my five beautiful, beautiful godchildren, and so on. Um, my list is long, but this is where I'm whole, it's where I'm alive, and I'm able to love most deeply, and I think that's what vocation's about. The 20th century theologian Howard Thurman wrote, ask yourself what makes you come alive and do that, because what the world needs is people who have come alive. I think this is our challenge as ministers, I think we are called as the people in this room to invite young adults in to help provide space for true vocational discernment to occur and then provide opportunities for them to come alive in those passions. And then ultimately, I think the Holy Spirit will take care of the rest. Thank you.